Hello, and welcome to Cognitum, a show dedicated to the present and future of science and technology. I'm your host, Iosef Gerstein. Our guest today is Dr. Petranovich, director of the Abigail Adams Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Previously, Dr. Petranovich taught political science at Duke University and Yale University. His scholarly expertise is in 19th century European and American political and social thought, and he is currently writing a book for Yale University Press on nationalism and the North in antebellum America. Danilo, welcome. Thank you, Josip, very much for having me here this afternoon. So tell me, why did you choose to dedicate yourself to the Abigail Adams Institute? Sure. So um, the Abigail Adams Institute is a relatively new initiative in Cambridge, Massachusetts, about five years old. It is an academic reform institute and an independent scholarly institute that um, was set up, uh, again, about five, six years ago by a group of concerned Harvard alumni, including myself, who wanted to address certain uh, recent trends in higher education, most particularly Harvard in this case. So what were some of those trends that the Abigail Adams Institute was designed to counteract or at least to address? Uh, as you probably know uh, from watching the news and paying attention over the last few years, maybe even decades, the uh, American University has seen um, there have been quite a few disturbances at the modern campus, including uh, protests, various uh, charges of uh, corruption in the admission scandal game, and, and whatnot, deplatforming of, of speakers, and, and so on and so forth. Um, this, especially the sort of um, curtailing of free speech or free, free expression on campus, goes under the category of political correctness. So we've, um, we would like, we like to address uh, that aspect of the crisis in higher education. In other words, um, the aspect of concern with speaking freely. So this, of course, concerns students uh, as well as faculty, but also other stakeholders in the university. But the second, and I would argue more, more permanent, or I would even submit perhaps more long-lasting, uh, long-standing and uh, trend in higher education has been the uh, over-specialization. In, in research, uh, in teaching, and in general over-specialization of the academy, of the, of the university uh, in particular, of Harvard, and this, you can particularly see this at, at Harvard University. So what do, I, what do I mean, what do we mean by this uh, at the Abigail Adams Institute? Over-specialization um, is, on, in some sense, nothing new. This trend has been with us since probably uh, the 19th century. Uh, in, in, in some so late 19th century, but it is really accelerated in the last uh, few, in few decades. So in most general terms, the problem is that more and more uh, time of, of the, the, the scholars, the teacher, the scholar teacher at the university is dedicated to production of research. And that production of that research is happening in narrower and more narrow, narrower fields. Uh, and we are losing uh, uh, the, the, the teacher generalist at the university level, the college teacher. Um, this particularly affects, now this is also a great success of the modern uh, university, of course. Uh, the advances in science and in scientific research have been uh, tremendous. And this is, uh, university in this sense is a victim of its success. Um, however, uh, the student in particular, the undergraduate student, but this also includes uh, the graduate students, uh, have been affected uh, negatively by this trend. Uh, why? Now, I should say, I myself, I was a college student in the late 90, 1990s. I graduated in 2000 from Harvard College, and I've had some of these experiences and a lot of time to reflect on them uh, subsequently. You can get an amazing education to this day as a student uh, at Harvard, and not only the college experience. College experience, the status symbol that goes with the Harvard education, of course, is highly desirable. But you can also get an extraordinary education, um, e even a, a solid core education. We used to be known as a core education at Harvard to this day. But you have to uh, 
uh, do it in such a way that you yourself, as a student, uh, are, are in charge of it and piecing it, piecing it together. Uh, what is unfortunate about that is that the university as a whole, or the faculty, who are at least nominally should be in charge of the, the university and how the university is run, um, do not offer a very uh, coherent general program or general education for the undergraduate student. They are, because of the various pressures at the, at the uh, modern university, too busy um, searching tenure, getting promoted, advancing knowledge in their respective fields, and uh, uh, giving too little attention to the education and formation of the students, again, in particular the undergraduates. So what we try to do at the Abigail Adams Institute, again, this relatively new initiative, is highlight some of those uh, um, deficiencies in, in modern higher education and address them in, in various ways through our own programming, through working with those uh, faculty, students, and alumni at the university who see things in a similar way. Mm -hmm. So why is liberal arts, or sometimes as you call it, humanistic education more relevant than ever? Um, very, very good question. Now, it's always uh, been relevant, and uh, it's always uh, liberal arts education uh, as opposed to, say, technical education. Or, or, or civic education uh, even um, is, is, is very important and relevant because it, it is important for the formation of a free and independent human being and uh, free and independent citizen, ideally. Um, today, um, liberal arts education is under even more of an assault, uh, if, if you will, because of the trends that I've uh, outlined uh, at the modern university, but also more broadly in our culture. Um, wh one of these, uh, one of these uh, trends and, and, uh, is um, uh, the spread of new technologies in, in our uh, society and culture, and these of course include um, uh, social media uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and various uses of, of, of technology in the classroom. Um, but not, not, only, not only those. Uh, I would say there is a crisis in um, the uh, American economy, political economy. There's also a crisis in American culture and society more broadly. All of those um, contribute to uh, affecting uh, uh, liberal arts education, especially how we value liberal arts education. There is, and this is I'm putting on my public intellectual hat, uh, right now, um, there is a sense uh, and, uh, among the students and the parents that liberal education is something of a, um, uh, a luxury, and it is not something that is necessary or perhaps even good for the young person to, to pursue. In other words, uh, the uh, asking of these big questions, or humanistic questions, permanent questions that we ask at the Abigail Adams Institute and, and, and uh, one would ask generally in, in a good core general education program uh, are seen as superfluous or secondary to the more basic task uh, of, of, of uh, what is seen as university education today, namely to credential, to teach basic skills, to credential the student, to uh, uh, teach various uh, uh, technical skills, proficiencies and uh, equip the student to do well on, the, uh, on the, the market after college, in the market, the job market after college. So um, that is another reason why liberal arts education uh, is uh, uh, maybe more suspect today th than it is generally. And as such, it has become rarer. And because it's becoming more and more of a rare knowledge base, is it going to be more or less important moving forward? Right. So this go uh, that that's a very good question. This this goes back to um, my my point about the the condition of our of our uh, the culture today in in the United States, even broadly in the West, perhaps even in the glo on glo uh, worldwide. Um, the reason this sort of education, uh, the the liberal arts or humanistic education that we seek to promote at the at the institute. The reason it is becoming uh, rarer is because I, I think people in the in the West, and again, perhaps most especially in the United States, are are losing um, a certain common basis of cultural uh, literacy or, or certain knowledge. They they are unsure 
what certain what what kinds of knowledge counts as common knowledge for uh, an educated uh, uh, person today. Uh, so we used to have uh, even go, going back a hundred years ago, certainly uh, 150 years ago, a much stronger uh, foundation of of of, 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 uh, of of knowledge of classical education of of of, of certain you know. Uh, literary traditions, uh, uh, historical sources, uh, philosophical and cultural expressions that we all had to be aware of and share as a culture. Today, uh, this, this kind of uh, knowledge base is being supplanted, uh, I would argue, by l less by um, you know, a different civilizational knowledge or basis, but more by a certain kind of let's say universal or technical civilization. In other words, our common language today is, is, is less uh, Shakespeare uh, than it is being adept in, with certain digital technologies, let's say, or, or certain ways of interacting in the marketplace with people, again, all over the globe. And I don't mean to say that this is um, uh, this new, let's say, new technical civilization is you know, something that is, that, that, that is bad in and of itself. Um, al although it certainly I is, is problematic if unchecked by certain different tendencies, it is certainly be very, very useful and certainly allows us, enables us to connect with people all over and to uh, engage uh, in, in, in different and creative ways. But what it does, uh, perhaps unbeknownst to many of us, is supplant, uh, uh, supplant the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the basis, the, the cultural basis of, of, of this more robust, thicker Western civilization th that we had. So you've heard the expression probably, uh, software will eat the world, or eats the world, or something like that. And, and this new um, technical or universal, uh, universally technical way of relating to one another um, may very much eat our respective uh, uh, cultures and, and a cultural basis of interacting with, with one another. So would there be any practical use, practical utility for dedicating oneself to a liberal education for a self-interested individual? Yes. Yes. Uh, another very, very good question. And I, um, the students uh, who come uh, to the Abigail Adams Institute or who uh, I had the, the uh, uh, chance and, and privilege to teach over, over, over a decade or so at, at, at Duke and, and Yale universities, uh, very rarely ask that question directly. Would, would, uh, th they see uh, the, maybe the impracticality of a liberal arts education, and yet they see it as something, um, uh, you know, again, perhaps luxurious, but maybe they don't even know necessarily why they need to have it. Very few, uh, perhaps nobody will ask me that question directly, uh, um, uh, has asked me that question directly. Why? Would it give me a practical example of why does this, how do, why does this benefit me? How can this benefit me? Um, and, and that's, again, a very good and hard question. Certainly, if you uh, were to spend your time in college uh, uh, teching up, as the students say today, and taking, uh, let's say, computer programming classes over at MIT or even at Harvard, or accounting classes or financial literacy classes, um, that will equip you of, uh, for uh, you know, the jobs of tomorrow, as sometimes uh, it's it said. They will perhaps prepare you, at least initially, uh, a little more, a little better than a class in, in Shakespeare or Homer or Dostoevsky, because um, you'll be ready to go right at the start and have the requisite skills. Perhaps uh, one can argue that in longer term, some of the, the, the insights uh, gleaned from these um, uh, universal, or <laughs> almost universally, may, uh, uh, very, very highly regarded and recognized uh, books uh, will, will come in handy, as it were, uh, later in, in life and, and even at work. Uh, but I would argue mo more importantly than, um, you know, strictly speaking, uh, utilitarian, uh, than, than giving a strictly speaking utilitarian benefit to the student uh, or to a person, uh, the, the encounter with these great texts, great books, and great authors gives one um, access to uh, a tradition and, and to uh, a way of being uh, in the world and way of relating to 
how other people who lived in eras very different than our own acted and, 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 and thought and, and, and loved and suffered and, and celebrated. That kind of um, identification with um, um, you know, ideas, uh, practices, events, moments of the past can, be, can give you uh, incredible solace in times of uh, 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 struggle, uh, and, and, uh, but can also be a great source of inspiration for um, coming up with, uh, with new ideas and addressing contemporary problems that, that you, you encounter. So that's one, uh, one way. Uh, other people make an argument, and I'm, I'm, I'm less sure of this one myself, that this uh, humanistic education or liberal arts education, acquiring it and being uh, versed in it, well versed in it, gives you, um, makes you somehow a better citizen or a better democratic citizen if you master um, these various uh, canonical um, um, you know, arguments or are aware of all, all, of, all of this uh, rich tradition, you will therefore contribute more in, in our democracy. Or um, There's uh, some indication uh, that that is the case, but uh, we also know that, that uh, very, very smart, very liberally educated people haven't been the best citizens of their respective uh, of their uh, cultures or or, or countries or, or e even uh, localities. So it's not quite uh, quite the same uh, relation. Um, uh, the other argument that people make: Yes, will it make you a better person? Um, in other words, is it is a liberal arts education uh, beneficial morally or ethically? Also, uh, uh, in some cases, yes, but 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 not not in not cer certainly not in every every case. Uh, it does widen your horizons. It does um, introduce you to a way uh, of, of thinking and, and, and to, human, uh, to human possibilities. Um, but that does not necessarily translate into ethical, ethical or moral behavior. So anyway, that's uh, one way of answering your question. Do you think, though, that having this baggage of culture and knowing your history does allow you to plan your life better, or to know not just how to go somewhere, but also where to go? I like that question a lot. I think um, um, if I can flip it this way, it can actually confuse you much more so, at least initially, than uh, if you were to um, choose a path or a direct path to a, a, a career or a, a, a even a way of life, if, if you will, the, um, right, right, off, right off the bat, um, or to follow into in footsteps of family business or something like that, maybe it will unsettle you and confuse you and disturb you uh, uh, <laughs> right off the bat. And, and, and um, um, so it might make it, at least initially, a little bit more difficult to, uh, to find yourself or to find your place in the world and how you can contribute. But um, I do think it will probably make you tougher in the, in the long term and probably you know even in the medium term because you will learn um that that um you you might learn that 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 uh, other people have faced similar problems and will continue to face uh similar problems that, that that you're facing in different stages in your life including you know as a young person right going into college or coming out of coming out of college uh now i haven't lived uh, um, a, a that long of a life, so I don't know. Uh, I can say I, can, I, I suspect it will be useful in, in uh, older age as well. And, uh, but, but thus far, it, it has been useful to me in, 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 in more than just the utilitarian way. Toughness, yes. resilience, grit. These, these things that we used to find, that we used to place a very high value on in our culture. Do you see it changing? And do you see young people um, being less tough recently? And, and do you think that has anything to do with a lack of, of, of education specifically in the humanities? Again, uh, very, very, very good, uh, insightful, insightful question. I think you've put your finger on something uh, important. Some people have said, and I do think I agree uh, with this to a large extent, that the modern student or the postmodern student, if you will, the 21st century student, is somehow um, more effete than, than student uh, in, in, in of, I don't know, uh, 
a generation or two ago uh, in the United States, perhaps, perhaps elsewhere. Now, that might be a function of um, general affluence of society or you know, softening of mores of our, of, of our um, um, more uh, a gentler, uh, gentler culture and a uh, culture that's more, more, more forgiving and cares more about young people and, and, and nurtures them and gives them all sorts of opportunities. I, I, if we have seen that, but is it a function, or, or I guess you're asking, does liberal arts uh, counter uh, education in liberal arts, would it, would it counteract that tendency? There's even an argument to be made that in my uh, liberal arts have been accused uh, uh, of this in the past as well. They make the citizenry or the citizen uh, body uh, more effete. Uh, and, and perhaps uh, less patriotic. There's this tension between liberal arts education and a robust civic education, where um, you know citizens, you know, think of so like a classically patriotic regime like a Sparta. You, you, you don't see necessarily. You wouldn't expect the Spartan uh, regime uh, or citizens of Sparta deliberating endlessly about the best way to live as they did in Athens with. Uh, Socrates, and th they're there to, um, uh, to be tough uh, and strong, to, to win wars and to follow tradition and to act nobly as they see it. Um, so liberal arts education, uh, paradoxically, can even contribute further to this uh, if, again, um, if one is not cautious, if one doesn't approach it uh, wisely with, with, with good instructors and, and appropriate dose of, of, of humility, um, uh, it, it can undermine uh, uh, w one's own uh, 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 society in some ways. Now, of course, it can strengthen it as well. Uh, you, you definitely do not want an ignorant or uh, a, a population or just the, a population which blindly follows uh, its, its, uh, its, its leaders. You want a, a population that is uh, aware of, of, of things beyond uh, uh, the, the here and now or just how we've done things up to this point. So it can cut both ways, again. Um, so I'm reluctant to, to, to answer your question, Yosef, in, in one way or the other, because I don't think liberal arts education is, is the answer to all of these challenges. I think uh, other, other uh, thing, things may be, um, like sending young people, for example, uh, to um, you know, a, a national uh, you know, uh, military programs or something like that, or, 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 or a substitute oh. for, for that, toughening them up that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, Socrates was executed for corrupting the youth, uh, and uh, specifically for undermining their patriotism with endless questioning. But they were coming from a starting point of high patriotism and a lot of civic duty where, with a deep connection to the culture. In, so in that context, the increase in liberal arts education, or <laughs> that's, that's really quite a misnomer, uh, the increase in questioning and, and philosophy was seen as a threat to the state. Whereas right now, in, in the 21st century, we have a citizenry that is very, very self-reflective, that already <laughs> engages with these questions. And now it seems that, in, at least in popular discourse, we have a disconnect with the canon and with our tradition and with our history. In, in the context of today, do you think liberal arts education can provide a role that would toughen and enrich our citizenry? Uh, very perceptive. Uh, comment in this sense in particular, you've, I, you, 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 you've said um, something that not many people, uh, in, in even the teachers in liberal arts education, uh, are, are aware of, and, and certainly it's uh, um, an issue with the broader culture at large. Namely, uh, today uh, our civic literacy, and not just literacy, our civic commitments, our, our, our civic pride, if you will, our Recognition of civic symbols and 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 pride in one one's own nation and what's been accomplished is is probably at a very low point, for all sorts of reasons. Um, I mean, you can just uh, observe the events of the last year or something like that. It's you know 2020, uh, uh, United States um, uh, that we're talking about, but. Even more broadly, this 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 is a trend uh, uh, again uh, a, a trend that that is. Um, um, perhaps tied to uh, abundance or affluence or something along those lines or or or, or a certain kind of 
empowered, uh, uh, in, in a very empowered individualism or, or, or cosmopolitanism even. The, the modern uh, uh, American, modern American, I think is, yeah, is, is patriotic. I, I, don't, I don't think, uh, well, generally for the most part, uh, is certainly more patriotic than the average European, I would say. Um, but nevertheless, that patriotism is certainly very much in tension with various uh, uh, self-interested, uh, self-centered uh, uh, motives, desires, expressions. So what we need to do even before liberal arts education, if you're talking about uh, how do we correct for some of these um, individualist excesses in our society, we would need to teach civic education before we teach liberal arts education. So you mentioned, you know, Athens and, and, and ancient, ancient Greece and Socrates arriving in that moment or, 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 or being um, part of that civilization, but also uh, of that robust uh, and rich culture, but also criticizing it. Uh, would Socrates today, a figure like Socrates, not, not undermine even further our civic bonds, uh, uh, let, let alone, um, w wouldn't that, would that be the main contribution or the main effect of, of a Socratic encounter today? That, that's a disturbing question to contemplate. But yes, first rebuild the, 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 the civic culture and then engage in these uh, broader questions, uh, I think is that exactly, exactly the right approach. Can you do both at the same time? And can you do different things? Uh, can you offer different kinds of education to different people in the different stages in their development? and in their uh, education. This is what I would like to see and what I would like to experiment with, um, that you can, in fact, have a two-track, both civic education and a liberal, liberal arts education. When you bring this up, the, the, the words that come to mind are late capitalism. It's the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It's, uh, it, 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 it seems almost hopeless. Uh, when, when, when you put it in, yeah. in, in these terms, uh, uh, do you think that we can have a resurgence and connect back with our, with our culture? And do you think that humanistic education has a role to play in that? Or are we fighting a losing war? Uh, yeah, now, now, now um, <clears throat> you're, you're putting me in a, in a tough spot of a prognosticator, but, but I, I do have opinions on, on this uh, as well, and I certainly think the fight is worth fighting win or lose. I don't actually think we have an option necessarily. Um, uh, yeah, funny, you use the term late capitalism. Now, of course, that's a term associated perhaps with uh, 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 you know, some of these uh, neo-Marxist or Frankfurt School uh, <laughs> thought. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it has its place in, in, in history of thought. I mean, you know, it's been late for a long time for many of these <laughs> uh, thinkers, our, our capital, late capitalist or mixed economy uh, 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 system or regime. Now, yes, we certainly live in a very mature uh, uh, capitalist society in the United States here, I, I, I would say. Um, yes, I, I, do, I do think, um, to, to, to give, give at least some justice to your question, uh, no, not all is not lost, uh, meaning, uh, uh, and I hope, certainly hope I didn't um, make it seem that way in the previous uh, answers, uh, all is not lost in the sense of all you know, um, uh, uh, the, the, the youth needs uh, so much uh, uh, basic education, basic literacy to even get to the point where we can begin liberal arts. Uh, that is true to some extent, but there's also, uh, uh, there's tremendous potential out there, and I've seen examples of, of, of very, um, uh, very impressive uh, uh, young people and impressive teachers uh, out there doing the good work. Now, it's not happening in the uh, numbers that one would hope for in large numbers. I mean, the, it's, it's in small pockets all over the country. Uh, but that's, wor that's, wor that's, that's a work, that's the work well worth doing because um, you don't need uh, liberal arts education, you don't need it to be successful on, on a mass scale for it to be effective. Some people even said it's in fundamental tension with mass scale education. You only need it to succeed in certain contexts with some people in order to uh, perpetuate itself. Thank you. Thank that you. That was yes, very sir. elucidating. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you join us next time as we examine and elucidate the frontiers of science and technology with the thinkers creating our future.